Welcome, uh, fellow technology enthusiasts, to another uh, edition of Jeremy Shows. This time, as you can see, I'm showing off the Sinclair ZX Spectrum Plus 2. Uh, this was a computer that was released in the uh, mid to late 80s in the UK and much of Europe. It never saw a release here in the United States and uh, really much outside of Europe, as far as I know. It was widely cloned uh, across Asia. There were a number of peripherals made for it and a buttload of games. Uh, the uh, ZX Spectrum line of computers began actually with uh, the Sinclair ZX80 and ZX81 uh, way back in the late 70s, uh, early 80s. And those computers were uh, monochrome graphics output only and no sound. I believe the only difference between the ZX80 and the ZX81 was the amount of RAM installed in the unit. So, the successor to those computers was the ZX Spectrum. The ZX Spectrum's claim to fame was that it had color and sound. Ooh, uh, Very rudimentary color though, not very many simultaneous on-screen colors, and uh, very rudimentary sound too. Um, think the PC speaker that's common in your average PC, only uh, less capable than that, and that's the kind of sound that the Spectrum had. Uh, so, from the ZX Spectrum, which launched with two models, uh, one had 16 kilobytes of RAM, and the, uh, the, the second model launched simultaneously had 48 kilobytes of RAM. Oh boy, tons of RAM. We're just swimming in RAM there, huh? Uh, at the time, though, that was a lot of RAM for a computer. And um, then following that, a couple of years later, was the ZX Spectrum Plus, which was basically exactly the same thing in a new case and a slightly less shitty keyboard. The uh, the very first ZX Spectrum had what's called a chiclet keyboard, which is the kind of keyboard that you'd find on a very cheap calculator, so not exactly good, especially not for high-speed typing. After the ZX Spectrum was the ZX Spectrum 128, which was an improved ZX Spectrum that had 128 kilobytes of RAM, and it came with an actual capable sound chip this time, as well as some other miscellaneous small improvements. Now, right around about that time, Sinclair decided that they wanted to um, get out of the computer business, basically, so they sold all of their assets to Amstrad, which was a competing computer manufacturer, manufacturer of uh, popular computers such as the CPC-464, which I'm looking into buying, and the uh, there was something else in there, and then there was the CPC-6128, and there was a couple other computers. So right around about the time that Amstrad bought Sinclair and all of their computing assets and even all of their inventory, uh, they redesigned the ZX Spectrum 128 to, be t to become what you see here, which is the ZX Spectrum Plus 2. This computer is basically a Spectrum 128 in a different case with some slight software changes. Uh, one of those software changes was removing the tape test option from the 128's boot up menu because it wasn't necessary anymore because the tape deck is built in, so we know that it's good. That's something else I failed to mention, is that the primary storage medium for the entire ZX Spectrum line um, was cassette tapes, which, is, uh, which was a very common storage medium in the UK, but not at all common in the United States. In the United States, we pretty much used diskettes for everything. Um, gee, what to say about this computer? Um, one of the primary improvements to it over the Spectrum 128 is it has a full proper keyboard. You can actually type on this thing and it feels like a real keyboard. So yay, that's nice. Um, also, like I said, the, the built-in keyboard, or built-in uh, cassette recorder, which they call a data recorder. Ooh. Uh, the design of the Spectrum Plus 2 is actually very similar to the CPC-464. They look very, very similar in overall design. Keyboard, keyboard and uh, cassette recorder integrated into one unit. So let's uh, have a look around this unit. It has a number of keys on it that I haven't seen on any other computers ever, basically. Uh, a lot of um, extra keys that made basic programming a little faster. Uh, basic standing for beginners all-purpose symbolic instruction code, which was the primary programming language of this computer and a number of other computers from the time. Um, it has true video and inverse video dedicated keys, which um, allow you to turn on 
text that has the colors either inverted, which is in what invert video is for, or to change it back to normal colors. Uh, inverted means it just swaps the foreground and background colors. Uh, it also has a graph key, which changes the cursor input mode into uh, one of several modes, which is graphics, where you can type keys on the keyboard to actually type graphics on the screen. Uh, that's something I should mention about the technology in the Spectrum line, is that it wasn't quite graphical. It was really designed so that um, it could output text mode stuff on the screen. So there was a grid of characters available on the screen, and you could choose a character, a foreground color, and a background color to put at any location on that grid. You could also reprogram the character set, or the font, built into the computer to whatever you wanted to. So that's how you achieve graphics on the Spectrum, is you would take something like the letter Q and you could reprogram it to look like, say, a smiley face. And you can put that smiley face wherever you want to with a foreground and a background color. So, um, that's how you achieve graphics. Um, edit, I believe, is another uh, cursor input mode. Uh, extend mode alters how some of the keys work. Caps shift is the same as normal shift. Caps lock, of course, you know what that is. Uh, symbol shift is another way of entering different keys on the keyboard. Uh, that's worth mentioning is that many of the keys on the keyboard, you don't see them on this model, but on the original uh, ZX Spectrum and the ZX Spectrum 128, each key actually had like four or five different things you could do with it. And so by using these extended keys, like symbolic shift and extend mode in combination with a key, it would do something else. Uh, different kind of input, that kind of stuff. It also has um, some kind of, what I thought was kind of strange character choices for the keyboard. Um, break right there, which is in the position of backspace and delete, backspace on IBM keyboards and uh, delete on Macintosh keyboards and Apple keyboards, uh, doesn't actually do that. The break actually breaks you out of the current running program or it's reprogram reprogrammable according to software. I can talk, I swear. Uh, the actual backspace key is way over here and it says delete on it and that's how you backspace. And you can see um, we have pretty much a standard QWERTY layout right here. Uh, it doesn't quite have the other keys over on the right that you would see on an IBM keyboard like the semicolon key and uh, some of the other symbol keys. Um, but some of those have dedicated keys down here. See so we have a dedicated semicolon key, a dedicated quote key, and then we have cursor keys left and right, and cursor keys up and down, and we have the same, some of the same shift keys here on the right. Going over to the uh, cassette recorder, you have standard cassette recorder controls. We have record right there, play, rewind, fast forward, stop eject, and pause. Let's have a pop open the tape thing here, have a look at it. It's nothing particularly out of the ordinary, looks like a standard cassette deck. Um, the computer actually does not have software control over this cassette deck, unlike the cassette deck that you can hook up to the Commodore VIC-20, uh, 64, and 128. The computer cannot tell the, the, uh, the tape deck to pause after you've already started playing it. So on those computers, the way it would work is you would press play, and then the key would stay down just like, like that, but the software could tell the actual tape deck to pause or resume playing. Whereas on this, it follows the original Spectrum um, hardware in that the ZX Spectrum and the ZX Spectrum 128 did not have an integrated cassette recorder. You were expected to, to provide that yourself. And the only way that those connected to the computer was through a microphone um, input and a headphone output. And so, as you can imagine, that doesn't provide the computer with any control over the cassette deck, and so that's exactly the way the cassette deck works in this too, because it's uh, backwards compatible. So, let's uh, spin the unit around here, see what we got. On that side we got nothing. Okay. <laughs> On the back we have 9 volt DC power supply, uh, which is good, because I believe that means I can use an ordinary power supply to plug into that an ordinary standard 9 volt DC power supply, which are cheap and plentiful. Um, although I was lucky enough to get with this computer the actual original power supply for this. It actually says Sinclair right there on it. And as you can imagine, it's a, the standard brick on a rope kind of thing. 
that you see with uh, lots of stuff. Even uh, some game consoles are like this. The GameCube is one of those. Uh, one end of that has a UK power plug, which I have a voltage converter that I can plug into that. That steps the North American 110 volt voltage up to 220 so that I can actually use this. And at the other end of that brick on a rope, we have the ordinary barrel connector that plugs right in like so. So um, I realize that I'm doing kind of like extra work here in that I have a voltage converter to go into this. And then, <laughs> so the voltage converter converts the voltage from AC 110 up to AC 220. And then this converts it back down to nine volt DC. So what I probably could do is just use an ordinary uh, 110 volt AC to 9 volt DC AC adapter, which like I said, are cheap and plentiful. But I didn't want to risk blowing this thing up just in case I got it wrong, because something else you have to consider on uh, DC power is polarity, and I didn't see polarity labeled anywhere on this unit. And polarity can be either positive or negative, and I didn't want to risk, you know, getting the polarity wrong and just blowing the whole goddamn thing up. So I figure I got the original power supply, I'm going to use it. Kind of worrying is don't know if you can hear that, but there's something rattling around in there, and I'm not sure what that is. Um, I might have to actually crack this open and figure out what's rattling around in there and get it out of there. Now, moving on. On the back of the unit still, we have the expansion I.O. bus connector. This is a standard connector for the ZX Spectrum series. So stuff that you can plug into the ZX Spectrum and the 128 can, in theory, also plug into this. And then you have some... Uh, very strange looking proprietary ports. You can see that these are actually sort of phone connectors. You can see the pins right there on the inside, except unlike a normal uh, North American uh, phone plug, this of course has more pins. North American phone plug has four, and you can see the part where the clip connects to it, which would be right on the side, is on the left instead of on the top. I did some research and found out that this is actually called like a British phone connector. Only um, apparently even these versions of that connector are not quite standard. So yeah, uh, these ports allow you to have, like it says, RS-232 standard serial and slash MIDI output out of the one connector. I'm not exactly sure how they do that. I guess it has to do with the number of pins. Uh, but you can hook a MIDI synthesizer up to this and play music through it that way. I was looking for software earlier to see if anything supported that, but I couldn't quite find it. And then, of course, I'd have to either buy or make my own cable to actually convert that to a standard MIDI DIN plug, which would then plug into my keyboard, which I'm not going to do that. <laughs> it's a lot of work. I might buy something, but again, only if I can find software that supports it, and really even then just as a novelty. Uh, the keypad connector right there. There was an external keypad available for the uh, Spectrum 128, I believe. Only I don't know if it used this connector. And I seem to remember reading somewhere that they, the keypad for this was never actually released in the United Kingdom. It might have been for a different model than this one. I don't know. Then we have an RGB port, which this provides uh, with the right cabling, composite video output, and... Uh, what can be converted to component or VGA output. Of course, VGA being at the VGA out of this port being 15 something kilohertz instead of 30 something kilohertz, so not quite VGA compatible. Um, so you wouldn't be able to hook it directly up to most VGA monitors. You'd have to have a converter that goes in, in between that either scan doubles the horizontal scan rate from 15 up to 30, and then it would work with a VGA monitor, or have a box that's already capable of 15 kilohertz, which I have. I also have a cable on the way that is going to do composite video, which will actually allow me to play and stream this thing. Um, because right now I'm having to use the TV output right there, which is an RF output, and the cable that plugs into that thing, it's actually around my feet here somewhere. I'm not going to show you because there's a lot of shit behind me right now. It looks like where are we? There we are. Now we're in the shot. <laughs> it looks like that, which is normal uh, RCA connector. This one's actually quite old. It came with my Intellivision, but it worked quite well, surprisingly. Uh, that plugs right into there. But then we have an inherent problem with video signals. See, since this computer was made in the UK, designed for use in the UK, that means it uses UK video signals. And in the UK, they use PAL, 
or PAL, instead of NTSC, which is what we use here in the United States. This presents a problem when trying to connect it up to something like an, a US NTSC VCR or something else that can tune the output from this thing, because it outputs on um, a standard TV channel, uh, and then that has to be tuned and converted into something like composite to see on a TV, or the TV has the, uh, the tuner built in. So, um, since it's a different video standard, that means that it can't quite connect up to what I have here. Uh, what I have right going right now, which is not quite compatible, but just barely, just enough to play, play with it, is I have the cable from this running into an NTSC VCR, which tunes it on something weird, like channel 85, I think. And um, then I have the output, composite output from that VCR going into my converter box, which then allows me to record stuff or see it on my TV. Uh, the problem with that is, like I said, the video standard is different, and so... Um, the common problem that you would have with putting a PAL uh, video signal into an NTSC monitor is that two things would be wrong. Number one, the vertical scan rate is 50 hertz instead of 60, which is what NTSC uses. So typically what you would see on the screen is you'd see the picture rolling up and down like that until you adjust the vertical hold on the TV so that it'll actually lock onto that scan rate. And number two, um, the video signal coming through in PAL, even when converted to composite like that, is actually still different. So the video signal that can be picked up by my equipment over composite comes through in black and white instead of color. So even still, even having those two things working against me, both the incompatible scan rate and black and white, it still almost barely, barely works through my VCR and through the rest of my setup. So I can play with it, but the screen's like all kind of twitchy a little bit and it's really blurry and shitty because this is RF and that's just not a good quality output. But like I said, I am able to play with it and I do have a cable on the way, composite cable, like I said, for plugging into that. And then that will fix everything because the composite out from this can go straight into my composite to HDMI adapter and that does support PAL, so it should be fine. Anyway, moving on, we have a sound output right here, which is ordinary line level audio, uh, mono only. And so that's compatible with all my stuff. Over on the left side of the unit, we have two joystick ports, and a reset button. Now, odd thing about these joystick ports is they look somewhat standard. As you can see, they look like an, a standard 9-pin, uh, I believe that's called a DE9 connector. But you see that on lots of old video game consoles, and it's used as the standard serial port connector on most PCs. Except PCs nowadays, which don't come with that, because, well, we've evolved beyond that. <laughs> Um, the problem with this is the signaling involved, or actually the implementation. Um, the port makes it look like it's compatible with stuff like a Genesis controller or a Master System controller or MSX or Atari 2600, all that kind of stuff. But it's not, not really. Um, the way that these joysticks are implemented is they are implemented as if you had what's called what was that called? The, uh, the Spectrum Interface 1 or 2. It was an adapter that you plugged into the back, this expansion connector, and then it would give you joystick ports. But the way that those joystick ports were implemented, as far as the computer was concerned, is they just came into the computer as if you were pushing specific buttons on the keyboard. They weren't anything special. And Apparently, uh, that was not the prevailing standard for, for uh, joystick ports on the Spectrum. What was actually the prevailing standard, which was called the Kempston standard, which was another adapter that plugged into the back right here and still allowed you to plug, plug into a connector like this one, except it allowed for a standard connector that allowed you to plug in stuff like an Atari 2600 joystick. And this required special software support because it was not emulating keyboard presses. It actually came in through a completely different mechanism inside the computer, but it still had very, very wide support for games. Um, whereas this one is not very widely supported. 
So um, I may actually be buying a Kempston joystick interface to plug into the back right there so I can play more games. Um, notice right here it says use only Sinclair SJS1 joysticks, which I have one of those. And it's right here. Now, two problems with this. <laughs> Number one, this joystick's total shit. Watch this, I'll just wiggle it. I'm wiggling it just a little bit, and look at that, it's going all over the crazy, all over, all over the place, it's crazy, it's ape shit. And that's because inside, it is very, very low quality. There's a very, very cheap PCB inside there, and there are directional buttons on the inside that are on the left, right, up and down. And the problem with those little buttons is they apparently wear out quite easily. So like, two of the little buttons on the inside of this actually work sort of well, but the other ones are almost completely flat and don't even work at all. And I think that the centering on this joystick and the stability is dependent on those buttons not being flat. So that's why you get all this wiggle with the joystick, because I'm moving it right now, and the computer wouldn't even know that I'm doing that. I'd have actually have to push it somewhat hard in a particular direction, and then it would register. So that's the number one problem with the joystick inputs on this particular computer, is that the one that they want you to use is total shit. So that goes over there. The other problem is, whenever they made this connector, not only did they use a less popular interface for these ports, but they were very sneaky about it, and they swapped some of the pins on these inputs so that you could only use that stupid fucking joystick. So, yeah, dick move, Amstrad, dick move. Anyway, that is um, the Spectrum Plus 2. <laughs> there was no Plus 1, there was just a ZX Spectrum Plus. Um, this computer, like I said, takes audio tapes, which I have a number of, this one is Disco Dan, which I have not played yet, <laughs> but that some of them have uh, colorful artwork on them. And open it up, and it's just an ordinary audio cassette. So easily copyable, these things, as far as I know, if you had a dual cassette tape deck. Also inside, there's usually instructions on how to load the game, because um, you typically have to type in the word, well, you always have to type in the word load, and then you press the play on, on the thing. Only after the word load, you have to tell it the name of the program you actually want to run, and that's what you need these instructions for. And it'll actually tell you what you're supposed to type. The loading instructions, it tells you blah, 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 blah. It tells you to press the J key after you see the Amstrad thing, which on, you see J, it says load right there. You press that at that particular point in the boot sequence, and it types out the word load for you. Then, what you have to do is type the name of the program in quotes, which right there, it says you should press J, and then type two quotes back to back with nothing in between. And that's a typical way that I've seen to load these games. So, once you do that, you hit enter, the computer is ready to receive data from the recorder, and then you press play, and then you wait about five to ten fucking minutes for it to load. Of course, there's ways around that, which I have discovered. I'm going to put this back in here before it goes someplace weird. Um, I found out that what you can do is you can take, believe it or not, you can take one of these car uh, cassette adapters, which were common whenever their cars had uh, cassette decks, but not CD players. So it has this standard 1 8 inch stereo audio connector on one end. That wire goes into the tape thing here, and then it outputs that audio over a, a head like this. Well, this head, not like this one, it's literally this one. And then this emulates having put a tape into the cassette deck. And so all the audio goes through this head and into the head inside the cassette deck. So what you use this for is you put this in here like this. So it fits right in there, very nice. And then you plug the other end into a PC, believe it or not, you plug it into an ordinary PC's audio output, and then you use a program called OTLA, which is a free program, I don't know what that stands for, and you get tape images, which I'm not going to tell you how to do that, you just find them. And uh, then you play the tape image, and it goes out of the computer, over this wire, into here, and into the cassette deck, 
and into the head, and as far as the spectrum knows, it's reading a real tape. Uh, the cool thing about using OTLA is you avoid all of those atrocious load times. Like, I had to do some tweaking with the settings on OTLA, but eventually I was able to get it to load a tape that normally would have taken like five minutes in about 10 seconds. So that's fucking awesome. Uh, you might be wondering why it's that way, why it only takes act why it only actually takes about 10 seconds to load a tape that way versus a real tape which takes about five minutes and that had everything to do with the fact that these audio tapes would deteriorate over time and they were recorded using various different recording qualities and they were never quite sure how good the tape was going to be going into the system so they put in uh, a lot of error correction and a lot of uh, metadata I guess you could say into the tape stream to make sure that it would work which of course bloated the stream way up and made it super long. But uh, with the audio quality of standard computer sound card output these days, it's much higher than that. So we can eliminate most of that error correction and do it a hell of a lot faster. Uh, you can also get for this, which I believe is part of one of those two Spectrum interfaces that plugs into here, that gives you the joystick ports. It also gives you a cartridge port. And there were about Two and a half games released for the cartridge port, and so <laughs> that might be something I get at some point just as a novelty. Maybe, maybe not. So, um, I don't actually know what else I can say about this unit, other than I'm excited to play it with a good video cable that's supposed to be arriving any day now, and I definitely will be uh, playing that on my channel. I would like to track down some of the games made by Ultimate, which was the predecessor to Rare, which was, of course, my favorite video game company in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s and mid 90s. They made many classic games such as Donkey Kong Country and they basically, along with Nintendo, carried the N64 for most of its life. So I would definitely like to check out some of their earlier games when they were called Ultimate. Uh, they had a reputation for being the highest quality games on the system, which is no different than Rare's reputation on the Super Nintendo and N64. So. Um, hmm. I can't think of anything else to show you for this, except that, um, uh, I got the manual for it, too. And no, I'm not going to go through the whole damn manual, don't worry. <laughs> but I think it's pretty cool to still have the manual after all these years. And, um, I got actually a lot of games for it, surprisingly. Um, I got this entire package. Uh, everything that I've shown you has all come from the same guy. He's a nice, uh... British fellow by the name of Andrew Jones, and he sold me all of that stuff, plus these tapes, these games and utilities in their original big boxes, and one of the tapes that I knocked off before, which is that right there, he gave me the joystick, he gave me all of these games, and he gave me the games that I've already tried playing and loading, which are those games right there. And he gave me all of that stuff with shipping included for around 160 bucks. So I think I got a hell of a deal, especially since it all works. I don't know if all the tapes work. Some of them don't work. Rasputin, I try to load it and it just goes garbly and goes, I fuck you, I hate you, I'm not going to do anything. But not quite in that voice because the system's not voice capable. <laughs> so that's about it. Uh, can't wait to play this on my channel. Can't wait to show you more of what it's like. And can't wait to try some uh, Spectrum 128 enhanced games which use the enhanced audio chip built into the system. Give me some good music instead of just simple bleeps and bloops. So until next time, until the next Jeremy shows, see ya.